we are, we're starting a new series this week. That's why we're doing small groups, because we want people to be able to engage in the message uh, long after this is over. So um, we're, we're starting up a new series uh, this uh, week, going into the summer a little bit, uh, on relationships, okay? And we just feel like, you know, this is, uh, this is the most important thing that we could touch on and talk about, and we need to revisit this this topic again and again and again. And um, my, my backup for that uh, assertion, that belief, is that um, Jesus, on the night before he got crucified, um, he sat down with his best friends, right, his disciples, who were the people that he was leaving the keys to the kingdom car to, completely, okay? He was leaving everything to these, these guys. And he had spent three and a half years investing everything into them. Now, if I had spent three and a half years investing into a small group of people with a mission as serious and as important as the kingdom of God invading the kingdoms, the corrupt kingdoms of this world, um, I would have some pretty important stuff to say on that last night, probably, right? I'd want to get something important across and remind them of the the key things. And so what he did, this is all recorded by John, the same guy who wrote the scripture that they just read before. And um, and John writes in, in, in a good chunk of his book, he devotes just to this conversation, John chapters 13 through 17. And throughout this passage, he says over and over and over again, love one another, love one another. And by the way, love one another so that the whole world will know who you are. And to start this whole thing off, he actually took out a, a towel and a bucket and whatever he used and he, and he got down on his knees and he washed their feet. He washed their feet, which is something from that culture, something that a servant of a household would do to their master, their boss. They would wash their feet. Jesus turns around and does this to this group of disciples demonstrating this amazing love and then speaks to them about, first of all, his love for them and secondly, love one another, love one another. Then he wraps it all up with a prayer. It takes a whole chapter to get out this prayer, John 17. And in that prayer, Jesus essentially prays, you could read it for yourself, but if you summarize it, the theme of it is, I pray that they would be one. I pray for unity. I pray for oneness, okay? And that's where he leaves it off. So I don't know about you, but I I look at that and I find that to be quite the evidence that maybe God cares about relationships. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah, I think so. And so that's what we're gonna focus on uh, for a few weeks and of course beyond a few weeks because this is at the heart of the kingdom of God. And some of the things I'm gonna talk about today Um, some of them might be a little bit difficult because we're going to talk about some of the things that hinder relationships, okay? And um, this week, Kelly and I, we had a problem with our our car, her car, and it wouldn't start. And so, you know, I just, my first assumption was that uh, there was an issue with the battery, um, but it wasn't the battery. So we don't know what it is. So we have an appointment scheduled. We have to go bring the car to a professional, right? To a mechanic to figure out what's going on. I am not a car person at all. So I have no idea. And um, I was thinking about this in, in preparation for this, this message and, and particularly this uh, reality of how the vehicle of our relationships can get stuck. Um, things can... can appear like they're not starting, things are not going in the direction we'd like them to go, whatever analogy you want to use. And many times it's because we don't realize what's going on under the hood. And we might assume one thing, like it's the battery, but really it's something completely different. So we have the opportunity to go to the mechanic of our soul. Or it's kind of better than the mechanic of our soul. It's going to the actual builder, right? You're going to the factory, the origin, when you go to God and his word is like this diagnostic light that can shine on your heart and reveal what's going on and, and point out some things that uh, otherwise we would have been completely unaware of. And what I want to say this morning is that one of the biggest hindrances 
to healthy relationships is fear. And that's why John wrote these words that Ava and Faith read so beautifully for us, that perfect love casts out... Were you paying attention? Okay, all right, just testing you. Okay. So... um, Wherever love is missing, fear is operating. All right, so I want to—I just—I want to throw out a big hot button item. I want to get a little controversial with you today. It's just kind of how I do things sometimes. Apologize in advance. Um, you know, we live in a world that's very uh, comfortable in uh, the status quo, and so I. The way I look at it is that if, if I'm not, if we're not here making people uncomfortable from time to time, I have to question the validity of what we're doing. So I want to give you an example of how the spirit of fear operates and one way that I see it operating in dividing the world, particularly over the past year. So... I want to look at two major reactions of people towards COVID. And let me just say up front, disclaimer, that these are totally generalizations. I'm going to completely bypass nuances and, and details and little things like that in order to paint a broad stroke of things to get a clearer picture, okay? So I'm not purposely ignoring details. It's just trying to get to a, a bigger point. Hopefully that point will be clear. So, um, all right. Everybody okay? All right. So on one end, there's incredible pushback that's happened over the past year against certain mandates and masks and vaccinations, all that stuff. And for some, not all, but for some, for many, there is a growing concern of government overreach. All right? The idea of one centralized group of people telling everybody else what they can and cannot do. And when you get to the bottom of the concern, there is a a genuine fear um, of something along the lines of communism. Okay? And it's an age-old fear in our country, and it's rooted in very real history. Communism, which involves government overreach uh, in particular has led to a lot of problems and a lot of death. Not just millions of problems and death, but but tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, in the last century alone. Okay, now, on the other side of the aisle, I told you I'm doing generalizations here, um, you have people that are very offended by all the talk of communism when they see a legitimate disease wreaking havoc around the world, and for many people, wreaking havoc in their lives. We've had several people in our church community who've lost loved ones to COVID, people who are not here anymore because of COVID. So some people look at a different facet of history, not the communistic side of things, but the epidemiological, the the study of disease. That's just a big word for that, trying to sound smart. So... um, They look at like the study of pandemics and how they've taken out way more people than than something like communism has over the centuries. So think about this, okay, for a moment. Just join me in this thought experiment. You have a whole group of people or two groups of people who are essentially afraid of the same things but happening in different ways. Same root fear. You, you tracking with me? Same root fear, but it looking differently. And both things start with the letter C. And so often in these conversations, people miss the heart of the other person. So one person says, listen, if we let government overreach happen on our watch, like so many others throughout history, Millions of people could perish, all right? And the other person says, listen, if I let poor medical decisions happen on my watch, like many have done throughout history, millions of people could perish. 
And then this is, this is what happens next, okay? The, the, instead of realizing for a moment, taking a breath and realizing how alike we all are, the one person says to the other, you're a conspiracy theorist, okay? You don't understand legitimate science. You know, my sister's a nurse, my best friend works in the healthcare system and the vaccination department, my relative died from this. This is serious. And then the other person says, you are a blind sheep. <laughs> right? You're saying, I don't understand science. You don't understand history. You don't understand how people's rights get slowly stripped away from them bit by bit, and people stay silent. And then worse things happen. And what happens then is that they both dig their feet in deeper and can become enemies. Instead of stopping and listening more, and hearing the heart of the other person, and learning to first empathize with them before jumping to things like blame and accusation and defensiveness. You still doing all right? Does anybody want to throw a chair? I've had it happen in a meeting before. Not at this church, but that's another story. It wasn't at me either, by the way. They threw it at something else. Um, all right, I'm going to take the drama of COVID out of the, the equation, okay? So I want you to read another scripture with me. So this is, this is from Colossians. We're going to put up the Colossians verse. Um, yeah, I'm not done with Colossians yet. <laughs> we did a whole series on Colossians, but we're not, we're not through with this one yet either. So Colossians chapter 3, look at this with me, ver verse 12. Here we go. Here's what we heard proclaimed this morning. You are always and dearly loved by God. Oh, I could just camp there for a little bit. We should. You are always and dearly loved by God. That's how he starts this statement. I love that. Before he gets to the tough stuff, I knew I was going to have like, you know, this kind of cute intro today and stuff that would, you know, kind of dampen and lighten the atmosphere where I can get to this tough discussion on COVID. But he gives them the truth first, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. This is really where we start and end. You are always and dearly loved by God. And then he says, so, robe yourself with virtues of God, since you have been divinely chosen to be holy. And now he's going to actually define what holiness looks like, okay? Paul's going to tell us what, what it means to be holy. He says, be merciful as you endeavor to understand others. Go back again just so they see that last two words, last four words. Be merciful as you endeavor to understand others and be compassionate, showing kindness toward all. Be gentle and humble unoffendable in your patience with others. That's what being holy is. People think being holy is this religious thing. You know, it's, and it's, it's kind of what they expected God to look like, I think. And then, and that's why they killed his son, because he showed up and he didn't look like the way they wanted him or expected him to look. Think about this. Jesus shows up, claims to be the manifestation of God, and he starts building bridges with the enemies of the free nation of Israel, the tax collectors. And then he starts inviting conservative zealots onto his team as well, who are fighting for the freedom of the nation, just bringing them together. Then he builds other bridges with prostitutes and outcasts of society, he even goes to the Samaritans. The Samaritans, they're the ones who liberalized and denigrated the scriptures in, 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 their, in their viewpoint, right? And in, according to the text. And builds further bridges with women, with the poor lower class Galilean culture. And it's like, what was this guy thinking? But in this, Jesus is demonstrating the virtues of God. The character of God himself. That's what that means. The virtues of God, that's, it's who he is, which is holiness. 
Now, I'm, I'm reading this verse today to you because when we start a conversation, okay, about walking in love and being unoffendable in our patience with others and endeavoring to understand the other, one of the biggest excuses that will come with a message like this is something like this. This is not my personality. It's not my Enneagram number. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, you know, this isn't my upbringing. This isn't the way I was raised. It's not in my blood. All this empathy stuff. <laughs> but I would say to that kind of thinking, you don't understand the gospel then. You don't understand the gospel at all or what it means to be a Christian. Like, to be a Christian means that you died. You went into the water of baptism. And everything you were, every attachment, every single thing that defined you in this world died with Christ. And when you came up out of the water, there was no longer any excuses connected to your upbringing, to your psychology, to your blood. You can say, look, I'm struggling in this area because my mind is still being renewed to who I am and to this amazing love. But you don't get to say, I can't do that. Whew. Paul says, this is the gospel. You are loved by God, period. And a loved person gives love away. It's just, you're God's child to take it further. You're not just loved in this ethereal sense, God loved the world because he's the mechanic who made it. No, forget about the mechanic analogy and think now, father, mother, he birthed and created us. We come from him, from the spirit of God. You belong to him. Therefore, you are to act like him. And today is the day of this salvation. Not after 20 years of therapy. Today is the day. Today is the day for freedom, to live loved, to live in compassion. Compassion. So, a big part of compassion goes back to this verse be merciful as you endeavor to understand others, which would obviously include people you disagree with. Maybe? Yes? Go ahead. You could shout no. You can be the bold one in the crowd. <laughs> You're wrong. We'll pray for you later, but, you know. Um, endeavoring to understand others. Come on. If people could understand in a conflict how alike they are and how their core needs and wants are so much the same, but they're seeing it from the wrong ends. It would be a force. It would be a force of unity and of breaking down division. I'm just wrestling with my next. Can I go for another topic here? Um, whether you say yes or no, I'm just going to do it. I'm feeling bold today. I'm going to throw out another fun, light topic. Talk about our police force and Black Lives Matter. Okay. So, some of you might have seen a post from a police officer that went around social media a couple years ago. And I think it kind of resurfaced last year. All right? And... Um, this was a cop, Lieutenant Tim McMillan, who is from Georgia. And one night, he pulled over a young man who was texting and driving. Anybody know this story, what I'm referring to? Okay. Well, you can verify it. Look it up afterwards. Um, all right, so he pulled, up, he pulled over this young man who was African American. And the officer approached the police car. And this kid was 
actually quivering in fear. Like he had his hands up and he was terrified of the police officer. And it actually broke the officer's heart. Like it really impacted him. And he said when this, when this young man looked at him, all he saw was fear in his eyes. And he said, this is such a problem. It shouldn't be like this. And so what he did was he tried to make the teenager feel at ease. And he told the kid, I just don't want you to get hurt. But the kid was still shaking and was like, officer, do you want me to get out of the car? And the cop said to him, no, I don't want you to text and drive. And I don't want you to get into a wreck. I want your mom to always have her baby boy. I want you to grow up and be somebody. I don't even want you to, I don't want to write you a ticket. Just please pay attention and put the phone down because I just don't want you to get hurt. And the cop said he couldn't sleep that night because of the fear he saw. And he said at this point, it was no longer about, you know, white cop, black kid. This was about two human beings having a very human experience. And he wrote this in a Facebook post, and this is, this is what went viral. He said, I don't truly even care whose fault it is that this young man was so scared to have a police officer at his window. Blame the media, blame bad cops, blame protesters, blame Colin Kaepernick if you want. It doesn't matter to me who's to blame. I just want somebody to fix this. And little did he know that he was praying the very prayer, the very heart cry of the son to the father for unity. The very cry of Jesus. And that perfect love would cast out this fear that is robbing our nation. Because here's the fact of the matter. We're more one than we realize. We're all more one than we realize. And it's a tragedy, division, like we see in any form, is a tragedy before heaven. So I want to just, I want to leave you all with, I don't want to just like preach a philosophical message. I want to leave you with something practical today. All right? I want to leave you with some relational stuff. All right? So I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up in a moment, but I want to just highlight something, okay, from what, the, what this officer said. And uh, hopefully this is something you can walk away with today, okay? Because the problem, it's, it's not out there. The problem we have to start addressing right here, okay? And so, um, okay, so he said in this, in this statement, this post, he said, it doesn't matter to me who's to blame, okay? I want to explore that a little bit because... I know the sentiment out there. I know it's like, you know, if we just dealt with the mainstream media or if we just dealt with the systemic racism, we'd fix the issue. And listen, there is totally a place for those conversations, without a doubt. But there's actually a deeper issue that starts here, starts in our own lives, okay? And this is why Jesus was actually so offensive in his day because he shows up and all the people around him want him to go and take out Rome. All their blame is on this Roman empire who is oppressing them and destroying them. And Jesus comes and he stands in front of a crowd of 10,000 and says, actually, I want to talk to you today, folks, about forgiveness. And these people are showing up ready for a rally ready to go take down the praetorium, the Roman guard, with the miracle worker, Jesus. And Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of glory, stands up and says, Hi, everybody. I want to talk to you today about loving your enemy. Whoo! Wow, I could feel the heat rising in the room. Um, That's what he did. And it got him in trouble. It got him in trouble. So, um... Back to what the cop said about blame. Did you know blame shifting began in the Garden of Eden? 
Garden of Eden, it's like the first problem. First problem. God addresses Adam with what happened. What does Adam say? It's my wife. It's her issue. Don't worry, I won't go there. I'll, I'll talk about COVID and police, but I, I won't go there. Um, he goes then to the woman, and what does the woman say? It's this serpent. It wasn't me, it was the serpent. And listen, all I want to bring to the table here is that the first problem that comes into the garden of our relationships, like a weed, is blame. It's always somebody's fault, somebody else's fault. And we have to lock into this. By the way, the incident with the cop and this young man happened in Garden City, Georgia. And I just feel like there's something poetic and prophetic about that. Garden City, Georgia. So Adam and Eve were both speaking true things. I mean, Eve had an impact on Adam. That was true. And the serpent, obviously, if the serpent wasn't there, then, then Eve wouldn't have done it. But, you know, you can be right about details and wrong about the big picture. Let me say that again in case anybody, you know, decided to conveniently think of something else. You could be right about details, but wrong about the big picture. Wrong about an attitude. Wrong about the overarching relationship. And what was going on in this situation in the garden was that they were missing their own role. And healing always comes from the inside. And Jesus understood this. And he's like, listen, if I go bash Caesar's head in and we set up camp and create this great theocracy on earth, you're going to end up doing the same thing that Caesar did. Because you're not dealing with your own heart. You want to blame Rome. You want to blame all these people. If you don't deal with your own stuff, this world isn't going to get changed. The relationships of our lives are not going to heal if we're not willing to look at ourselves, folks. Everybody smile. Why? Do we let this weed into the garden? We're almost, almost there, almost at, at back at home plate here. Why do we let this weed come into the garden? I want to throw out one reason that's important for you as you go forth from here, walking in love, okay? I believe, number one, to bring it back, is that we're afraid. We're afraid. And what are we afraid of? We're afraid of being judged. We're afraid of being condemned. Being condemned is like a sting on the soul. And we will do everything in our power to avoid that sting. And so this is what keeps people from saying these two magical words. Yeah, I'm sorry. Or I was wrong, or you know what, I see your perspective. And not just I see your perspective so I can get to my point. I mean like, I I see, okay, I see what you're saying. I'm hearing you, really listening, really, you know, reflecting, that kind of stuff. It's just, this is key. This is so key, and a lot of us know this, but unless you're aware of that inner fear of condemnation, It's going to keep robbing you in your relationships. So we come back to perfect love casts out fear. And we come back to these beautiful statements that were made by these young ladies of who I am, who we are. Jesus Christ showed up on the scene as the manifestation of God himself. And he says, I have not come to condemn there, I, I, there is no condemnation within me. I have not come to condemn at all. In fact, if you will acknowledge your own stuff and if you will come to me, 
I will embrace you with tender mercy and compassion. I will wrap my arms around you. There is no need to fear punishment anymore. That might have been what you believed God was like, but guess what? I am that I am. I am he. And this is what he reveals to us. This is what he invites us into so that we can have the courage to release compassion and even forgiveness to others. We can have the courage to step into difficult conversations. The tough stuff that, that and this is why I, I don't, I, I don't want to just shove stuff under the rug. I don't want to just preach, you know, happy messages and move on, like, because there's stuff going on. And we're on a mission here. We're on a mission as a body, as a people, to see healing, to see unity. So we have to be willing to engage, but, we, but in engaging, there's a healthy way to do it and there's an unhealthy way to do it. And so, Lord, give us grace and peace and help to walk in love. God, give us grace to, to um, be unoffendable in our patience. I just say one last thing about patience. That, that the word for patience and even the next verse in Colossians, it talks about tolerating others. La- this is important. La- last thing. They, Paul writes to tolerate the weaknesses of others. Because there's going to be moments where, guess what? You're actually right about something. You're right about a detail. Okay? And another person's wrong. So he, he uses this word tolerate right after he says have patience. And that word tolerate, that word means literally to like make space for somebody. Okay? To make room for another person. And the idea there, if you could imagine a room filled with clutter, and that clutter, this, you know, furniture, all this stuff is like offenses. And bitterness and all that stuff. And it's saying, listen, you need to just just push that away, push it away, make space for this person in their, their deception or whatever's going on, make space for individuals, love them, forgive them, because you're secure in who you are, show them mercy, trust God to work on them. Trust the Lord to work on their heart And don't think that's your battle to fight. Don't take that burden on because it will drive you crazy. So so make this space in your heart and allow the Lord to do the miraculous in those situations. Okay, that's enough. I'm going to pray in closing. Jesus, I just, again, thank you for this word of your perfect, perfect love. Lord, I pray each heart today would be stamped, sealed, and marked by the word, I am loved, period. No no compromise on this. God, you are for us. We are always and dearly loved. I pray you would mark our hearts with the fire of that love today. And I pray, God, you would give us the grace to go from here, Lord, into our lives, into conversations, that we would become salt and light. Even on Facebook, Lord, I pray for salt and light in this room. On the internet, wherever we go, Lord, I pray for that that light of love to begin to break out from each and every heart here. Jesus, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let unity come by your spirit. Amen.